Karen Menzies, thanks so much for your time. Um, a full life led by you. And of course, football has been a key part of it. If you're able to take us back to the beginning, when you look in the, the rear view mirror of your life and, and how football started for you, um, how do you answer that question? Well, uh, look, that's a really easy question for me to answer because for me as a kid, football was everything, but I grew up in an era where girls were not expected, encouraged, and when it came to playing football at school with uh, the other kids, namely boys, I would then be disciplined quite harshly. I, I, I'd regularly get the cane, but but that was, wasn't even a deterrent for me because I just loved it so much that I knew that I was going to get into trouble. I knew that I was going to have to be picking up papers around the playground. I knew I'd eventually get caned, but I, I just kept doing it. Mm. I mean, how do you stop playing <laughs> when you can? Mm. So so where was this, Karen? And, and uh, your, your childhood, I'm assuming, was in Newcastle. Is that, um, just to divert um, slightly, is that your traditional country as well as an Aboriginal woman? No, my, um, my grandmother's country is in the Hunter Valley. Um, so the Wanarua people is where um, my whole family comes from. That's my maternal side. Uh, now, I grew up in Sydney for the first 13 years or so. So uh, those primary school days where that harsh discipline was meted out to me was in Sydney. And then I moved to Newcastle. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you know that I was part of the Stolen Generations. So I grew up um, with my Anglo-Scottish family, not knowing I was Aboriginal. And then things went pear-shaped and they put me in an institution when I was 13 in Newcastle. But look, I've got to say, I, um, and, and not to diminish or devalue or be insensitive to the horrendous and harrowing experiences that many people endured in institutions, I was absolutely one of the most fortunate because when I arrived at the institution, on my very first day, the house parents told me that it was sort of a requirement to have all of the kids doing a sport and they named soccer. And I think I maybe arrived about two o'clock in the afternoon and by five o'clock I was at the local soccer field <laughs> training with the local soccer team in a girls team. Like I'd never played competitive before and I'd never played with girls before. Mm. So it was just, it was remarkable for me. Your, your story is not an uncommon one, although there'd be a lot more people who've gone through that phase of their life who don't look back on the institutionalisation so kindly. Mm. Nevertheless, interestingly, you said as part of the stolen generation, Aboriginality wasn't acknowledged. At what point in your life did your Aboriginal identity um, take root for you? Was it, was it by virtue of the fact that you were institutionalised? Was that the first reckoning for you? Well, yeah, but not, not immediately. So uh, over the years when I started to feel like I could navigate what the institutionalised system was like, although I went to an external high school, so it wasn't all internal, and, um, and regular meetings with uh, all of the senior people about where I was headed in life. And um, so uh, I started to ask questions about, well, who are my real parents? And anyway, skip till I'm um, 16, and they said um, that I could meet my, my mother, and they gave me a photograph. Of, of my mum and my siblings. And I don't actually look like any of my family. And um, there was something very different about their appearance to me. And I just thought when I met my mum or saw my mum, I just thought there would be a mirror image. That was what I had in my head. And of course it wasn't. So it was, it was a big shock. One, that I was, I didn't look like my family two that I was Aboriginal and also I'd been educated throughout the 70s and the messages that I'd been given about Aboriginal people were, were most um, uh, unkind and, and derogatory so I didn't embrace it warmly and it was probably uh, not until my 20s that I started to have the confidence to unpack it and as an adult 
realising what had happened to me. And, yeah, so it was probably in my 20s when I, I felt confident about my Aboriginality and, and just confident in my own skin. Because I'd also been raised on that narrative that I had to look like somebody from an Aborig a remote Aboriginal community. I had to look like um, a certain way. And, and my image just didn't fit that. But then I realised that culture is given to us and inherited from our cultural membership in our families. And uh, well, my mum is Aboriginal, my grandmother is Aboriginal. And so it just made me a bit stronger in who I am. Of course, um, it's just incredible really to look back and share this with people. And you talk about culture, Aboriginal culture, um, but it was football culture, I guess, which is obviously the specific interest for, the, for this purposes. But you, you've said that football and perhaps its culture was a saviour for you. Oh. Um, how do you do, what do you mean by that? Well, I think because the institutional life was so not harsh in, a, in, a, in an abusive way because I was always safe and, and always protected, but... It was in a very big, large setting. It was in a very clinical setting, unlike a family home. So there was lots of things that were not particularly nice. And um, so because of my love of football and because my house parent was absolutely addicted to football as well, he, he'd been born in England. And uh, I think it was his father had played for the English schoolboys. So, so he had it in his DNA. <laughs> and so he was uh, my coach. And, um, and, and I think um, because of his involvement and his interest, he really cultivated my interest, um, which was already very high. <laughs> and so uh, being able to, whether it was playing football in the backyard, because that was one of the good things about living in a very large location. We had a decent size, almost half a uh, quarter of size field in the backyard where we could regularly play with all the kids in the institution. And, um, and then I'd say most afternoons after school, I was at either at uh, football training or out at the local park practicing myself. And so it was the thing that gave me uh, a sense of purpose, but, but, but probably also during those times, especially from 16 to 18, when things were very confusing, trying to navigate who I was as an Aboriginal person and not knowing what that path would look like, uh, I was able to draw on football as a way to, uh, I guess, uh, expel that pent up aggression, anger, whatever it was. I was a fairly aggressive player, not not um, deliberately aggressive, but but hungry is probably a better word. Um, if I may ask, was the institutional for Aboriginal kids such as yourself, or was it a, a broad spectrum a group of kids, and and or were there other Aboriginal kids? at the institution with you? Yeah, yeah, well, there was, see, uh, I knew that there was two Aboriginal girls in the institution with me because they looked like the pictures that I'd seen when I was in primary school when we covered Captain Cook and, and, a, vet, and a quick glance about what Aboriginal people look like. So, so those two girls did, but the rest of the girls all had sort of similar appearance to me. Turns out a lot of them are Aboriginal as well, but because they didn't know no it, one knew. They didn't know it. Yeah. Did they play football too? And um, was this was this a cohort of girls at the institution playing football? Did you infect them also? Yeah. Well, well, uh, I think so. But um, look, there was another um, resident there who's been really a lifelong friend. Uh, she actually got into the Matildas before me. She's a non-Aboriginal woman. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Leah was um, in the Matildas as a as a very young player, uh, fifteen or sixteen, I think she was picked in the Matildas. Was when she first went on her tour. So yeah, there was there was a whole soccer football vibe where we grew up, where, and watching football uh, on television, and and uh, while we had sort of had strict um, uh, times around bed and and getting up and all that sort of stuff, FA Cup 
all bets are off. We were up all night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially with an English you know, mentor teacher. I'm sure that that, that yeah. person made, made it happen. Of course, this all materialised in you becoming the first Aboriginal woman to play for Australia. Yeah. Um, your, your, your Aboriginal identity has, by this stage, I'm sure, taken pretty much full flight. Um, how significant, that maybe even as a political statement for you, even if at the time it wasn't, to be this first, to establish this beachhead for Aboriginal women in the national team of Australia? Look, I, at the time, I didn't actually realise that I was the first person. Uh, as, soon as, as soon as I was uh, named to be in the Australian squad and then the chance to go on and play for the Matildas, I... I, I wasn't aware of anything else. It was just I was aware my name had been read out and, and I was going to be in the Matildas. Um, so it wasn't until a number of years later when that analysis started to happen. Not, and, again, not necessarily from me, from others around me. But it was pretty, so, pretty special now. I have to I'm, say. I'm sure it is. It's, it's huge credit to you. Um, and, of course, Football might have been your saviour and the institution as a part of your life is, is what happened. Um, for kids in other institutions or for kids who stayed in community, um, there wasn't a lot of football for them and the game has slowly come into this recognition that A, it serviced these communities really poorly and B, the game has missed out on a lot of talent that uh, could have served our top elite football really well. So the question uh, to you at this point, Karen, given your education base, how widely you see the world now. How does football penetrate Indigenous communities better than it's done to this point? Oh, look, I, I think that there's a number of ways that that can happen. I think there's probably different levels. So, so at an individual level and then at an institutional level. So I think it's about people examining their own personal attitudes and behaviours and values about Aboriginal people and kind of removing that deficit lens in how we see Aboriginal people. And as you say, see, seeing the talent that's there and seeing the strength and resilience of Aboriginal people. So individually, we can all do that. And certainly at an institutional level, all of the federations need to be more proactive in making sure that they have good um, policies and procedures in how they engage with Aboriginal communities, Aboriginal leaders, good protocols in how they um, use those respectful engagement techniques. So, so there is lots of avenues in, in how to access these players because I agree with you, there is enormous talent out there. Uh, I guess this is my question. You used a really interesting term there, uh, deficit lens. Um, outsiders like me could perhaps be uh, criticised for having a surplus lens on you know, to flip it completely. That 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 outsiders like me and and you don't want to appropriate things, but I have this feeling, this view that um, our type of football is specifically suited to uh, Aboriginal athletes. Now I, I'm prepared to admit that could be an appropriation of mine. I could have a surplus lens on things. Um, but you can help correct us. Is it seriously worth football investing? Um, obviously, for social reasons and socio-cultural reasons. But is it worth football seriously investing uh, in, in Indigenous football? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and, and I don't think your, your lens is inaccurate because I I think if we are able to do some of those things that I just mentioned, I think we can see Aboriginal people do pretty much anything that because there is such incredible uh, strength and resilience across each Aboriginal community. And you only need to know what's happened historically and even currently in terms of the highly discriminatory laws, policies and practices that have impacted on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that the people have been able to weather that and yet still get up with a smile, still get out, face the world and still excel in different areas. So I, absolutely, I think that there's a, a huge pool of talent uh, just awaiting the Federation's invitation, really. Well, Northern New South Wales, to their credit, if belatedly, uh, are starting to dust off this, this apparatus. Um, 
we as a whole community can look back with enormous pride in northern New South Wales and see that it, somehow by hook or crook, yeah. it's produced Karen Menzies, it's produced Jade North, it's produced Gemma Simon, it's produced Lockie Wright, and that's just a few. Yeah. So Karen, um, I have to say massive congratulations to the career that you've built. Yeah. Very, very difficult beginnings and yeah. the contribution you're going to continue to make, including this interview here. Thanks very yeah. much. Yeah. Look, um, just before we finish, I think I think the other thing that probably the federations really have to address and get much more savvy about is the level of homophobia that players have to deal with. And and while in my early days, I didn't have a really strong, sophisticated sense of my Aboriginality, um, I was pretty clear about my sexuality from early on uh, at, at 2021. 20, and, and the constant homophobia that I had to deal with was extraordinary. And that came from every level. That came from other players, that came from coaches and managers, and that came from the Federation. So there is much work to do around uh, ensuring that we embrace diversity and celebrate diversity in football. Well, you're a big celebration of it. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Massive congratulations. My Good pleasure, Andy. Nice to chat with you. Bye-bye. See you later.